Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. It's about China's energy shift. And I am Li Sixuan. I'm an anchor from CCTV. I'm excited to have the privilege of hosting this panel on China Energy Outlook. So this session has English and Chinese translation. If you need a simultaneous translation headsets, you can have it from your chairs. More than two thirds of the world's rising energy demand. And despite slower energy demand growth in China, China remains the world's largest energy consumer. And yet China's energy mix continues to evolve with coal's dominance expected to decline, and as its renewable investments triple those of the U.S. So we want to discuss today this unprecedented transition uh, in the China's <coughs> energy sector and uh, what it portends for China and the world. So we will have about 40 minutes of panel discussions uh, with our wonderful panel today, and we will take questions from the audience. Uh, so now let me just quickly introduce our panel speakers. Uh, so I'll just uh, do it from the, start from our lady. So Ms. Uh, Tianjin, Vice President, Jinko Solar, People's Republic of China, welcome. And uh, Mr. Xin Baoan, President, uh, State Grid Corporation of China, welcome. And uh, Mr. Sun Xiexheng, Secretary General, International Energy Forum, welcome. And Mr. Atul Arya, Senior Vice President and Chief Energy Strategist, IHS Market. And uh, Mr. Dai Yongping, Chief Energy Sector Group and Asian Development Bank. So welcome you all to the panel. So as all of you can see that our panel encompasses a very broad and very interesting mix of panel speakers. Uh, we've got international organization and the world's biggest utility company, our market uh, insiders, and we have our national financier and market strategist. So it's a very nice mix. I want to start with uh, Mr. Arya. Could you please just help, out, uh, help us set a stage by putting China into the global context in terms of the global energy outlook? And uh, what are the trends you and your clients are most attuned to and where do you see as activity concentrating in China's energy sector? Okay. Thank you uh, and thank you for inviting me. Good morning everybody. Uh, I, I will set the scene for you First globally, and then I'll come back to, to China in a minute. Uh, so the globally, I think I start with the bad news, which I, everybody here will know that the world as a whole is not on a path uh, to one and a half degree, and actually not on a half path to two degree either. So we are on a path to a much higher temperature. And that's because of the fact that although we have done a lot to reduce the carbon emissions, uh, we are not doing enough. Uh, because the energy demand, energy is the engine uh, for the econ economic growth, and energy demand continues to remain uh, very strong. Uh, so let me uh, give you some specifics. So if you look at the global emissions, including agriculture, uh, electricity uh, emissions from electricity generation are only about 25%. We focus a lot on electricity, but there are a lot of other sectors. Agriculture is 21% of emissions. Transport is actually only 14% of emission. Uh, globally, uh, industrial sector is 21% of emissions globally today. These are data for now. Uh, so, so we need to look at strategies to reduce emissions across all of these sectors. And the one sector where the world as a whole has done a lot and is making a lot of progress is the power sector. And you will hear much more about what is happening in China in a minute, uh, which, is, which is the good news. But the bad news is that the, the power sector actually is relatively, relatively easy to decarbonize. There are other sectors which are much more difficult to decarbonize. Take, for example, industry. So by that I mean, say, cement, steel, fertilizer. These are extremely difficult sectors to decarbonize. So I think one of the things I would urge coming to China is that uh, continue to work on decarbonizing the electricity sector, which is great with the growth in renewables. Uh, but at the same time, think about decarbonizing uh, the, the non-electricity sector. A and one of the things we will have to do is think about continuing to use fossil fuels, uh, including here in China, where China is a big consumer of coal, but of all fossil fuels, then look at how do we capture emissions from those fossil fuels, uh, for example, using carbon capture and sequestration, which I believe has a huge potential uh, into the future. So I think that my, my big message will be the world is not progressing 
where we want to be. The other last thing to say is that energy efficiency, which we think about, you know, if we look at the energy equation, it's very simple, reducing the energy content per unit of GDP, and then reducing the carbon content of energy, you get to where we want to be. On the energy content per unit of GDP, the world and China made a lot of progress in the 90s when we call they were so-called low-hanging fruit. Since 2000 onwards, the progress has been lost slower. Just to give you a data point, we are decarbonizing global economy by 0.25% per year. We need to decarbonize a factor of five to 10 more than that, or sorry, reduce the energy efficiency by a factor of five to 10 more. So we are, we are on a slow path. We really need to accelerate the path. And, and China and the innovation which is happening in China is going to be a key part of that. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the insights. So we are acting, but we're definitely not acting fast enough. No, let's show you how to do this. So we talked about the action targets and what is the process of it. I want to ask this question to Professor Sun. As known to all that you are from, you are the head of the China Institute of the Oil Research of China. You have a deep insight of um, China's oil and gas industry. And now you're from IEF. And IEF, in terms of energy, has the, is kind of a think tank with uh, experienced uh, experts by 2020. And uh, now fossil fuel energy increased will be 15%, such a goal set by the government. By 2030, the goal will be 20% from the uh, renewable energy just now. Mr. S uh, Arya mentioned that action is taking place, but not fast enough. What is the view on it? Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Thank you for your question. I think that uh, in the uh, economic development and the renewable energy shift, there are three trends. First of all, the investment driven to the consumption driven from the uh, uh, extensive to intensive green development. The third one is the factor input. These are three factors in the shift. I think these are highly important to the energy shift. And in this energy shift, I think China has done very good. After Paris Agreement, the government, all kinds of factors, has adopted very strong measures. In terms of green energy development, the wind, the solar energy, and the geothermal energy, we do see fast progress on that. But in the energy shift, there are two factors in combination, highly important, I need to point out, in the energy transition. In history, we rely on the natural gas, coal, traditional fossil fuel, but now we rely on the green energy, such as wind, solar, geothermal, with low carbon emission. And this is an irreversible trend, I must say. Two years ago, President Trump quitted from the Paris Agreement, but this trend is unstoppable, and it's about whether we can have a faster or slower pace. It is true that the U.S. is very important. We need to encourage the U.S. to get involved. European countries like uh, France and Germany and uh, China needs to more. And uh, in terms of investment, technology, leadership with the U.S., they can play a very big role. The other thing I want to say is about the energy energy evolution and energy shift, we need to consider these two. Because in uh, fossil fuel, we need to see the trend towards green energy. But in the uh, artificial intelligence, the blockchain, and the smart cities, big data, cloud computing, and we need to incorporate these uh, smart intelligence into our uh, energy development. These are very important characteristics. Thank you very much. Just now, you make comments on the current situation. Also, you uh, highlighted the possible technology highlights in the future and some uh, new possibilities. Now, I want to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Xin Baoan. And we know that the state grade corporation of China is the world's largest power company. And just now, Arya mentioned that the whole industry is decarbonized, and the power is easier to do that. But from a, your company is very large. You are a very good observer. 
in witness the uh, shift of China's energy. And uh, can you share with us what is the situation of China now? How is the progress of your work? And how much we have a renewable energy in the energy mix? In the past, we have some uh, concerns such as curtailment. And uh, what is the goal we have set for the future? Thank you. Thank you for your question. The energy shift is kind of a uh, trend. And uh, the uh, trend direction is going to a cleaner, low carbon, secure, high efficient, greener prospect. Talking about the energy shift, the Chinese government has come up with a series of measures. And as the State Grid Corporation of China, and we are a global Fortune 500, also top 500 country in a company in China. In energy evolution, our company plays a pivotal role. And in the energy transformation, we uh, aggressively develop renewable energy production, which will be as the main direction of our work at present after several years' efforts. The installation capacity is up to 330 million kilowatts. And in terms of the total installed capacity, the percentage is up to 38% in the overall energy installment. At the same time, China is the largest and the fastest country in its clean energy development. Clean energy is highly important to the energy shift. We will give more efforts in the future and with higher clean energy sh share, fossil fuel percentage goes down gradually. This is one part of it. The state grid company nowadays is promoting the clean energy development. We have adopted all kinds of um, managerial technological measures. To a large degree, we want to digest and accept renewable energy. As known to all, ever since 2017 in Qinghai, we started the exploration of a green, the whole supply of a green energy in Qinghai province. And we, we also made world records in Qinghai province. And from uh, June the 9th to 24th, the whole province of Qinghai within these 15 days, renewable energy supply, uh, I mean the power supply by renewable is enabled across the whole province, which is a world record. It means clean energy is something we need to promote in the future. Talking about the wind curtailment, truly, it is a uh, sophisticated, systematic issue. Apart from the power grid, we try to uh, optimize our distribution and the dispatch. We try to maximize the acceptance of the renewable energy. In terms of uh, energy market openness, we try to do more. Therefore, the curtailment rate of China goes down drastically. I can share this with you. Per government regulation, this year, we are able to do the followings. Curtailment from the renewable energy is controlled less than 5% with more openness of the market and the macro state grade network expanded and the economic social development, we will have more renewable energy in our grid. Thank you very much. To our delight, we heard this statistics several years ago. I was in Suzhou. We had the energy forum at the time. At the time, the statistics was much lower than what you said just now. So behind it is not a simple technical problem. It's about a policy, market, so we need to solve it in a holistic way. Now I want to ask a uh, an industry insider, Mr. Uh, Ms. Madam Chen, and would you please to share with us the insights of the industry? I know earlier this year when you were interviewed, you said that in terms of a solar energy, the country 
has adopted a market-driven approach in terms of a cut back the subsidies and try to minimize the energy waste. However, by 2019, the increased capacity in 2019 will be much lower than 2018. So what will be its long-term impact on this industry? Well, I want to talk about uh, uh, Jinko Solar. And the one is the uh, Jinko Energy. It is one of the uh, solar energy component suppliers. For four years, we are the largest in the world. And the uh, shipment is uh, 15 to 16 gigawatt. The other one is uh, Jinko Power. It's an IPP company. In China, we have uh, 375 power stations. And we have, uh, in total, it is a 3.3 gigawatt. In overseas, we have a 3.7 gigawatt and a 5 gigawatt uh, backup power stations across 20 countries. So this is about the overall situation of uh, Jinko company from upstream to downstream because I'm from the, uh, um, I, I prefer uh, coating statistic. And in uh, 2008, it is the first time China incorporates uh, solar energy, renewable energy into 13th five-year plan, like you mentioned, by 2020. Renewable energy share in the mix will be 15%. And the solar panel installation, 105 million kilowatts by 2018 is already 14.3%. The total installation is uh, 170 million kilowatts. In its total capacity in absolute term, it beats our expectation. However, we need to make comparison to make assessment on our performance. From 2018, the newly increased lead capacity is 1.9 billion kilowatts. And the coal based installation is um, uh, 1 billion, accounting for 53%, 5% year on year. And the uh, solar panel, I mean uh, PV, and the 4.4. Um, 440 million kilowatts, 1.1 percent in, co in comparison. It is 18.8 uh, percent down, driven impacted by the uh, policy called the 515 because of the drawback of the subsidy. In terms of the electricity capacity, 2018, the total society energy consumption increased by 5.8 percent. Uh, Coal-based power, 63 percent, 3.3 percent more, and the PV, 1.4 percent and 0.1% year-on-year growth. And uh, to our uh, uh, delight, the uh, curtailment, because we have so many power stations, most of them are located in the uh, northwest China. We strongly feel the curtailment is improved in 2018. In uh, the curtailment rate, 2018, 3% down by 2.8% year on year. To us, we strongly feel uh, the progress. So from these statistics, we can tell that uh, solar energy led by PV is booming quickly, and uh, coal-based power station still takes a large share. Let me give you another set of data by the end of 2017. Uh, take California of U.S. example, renewable energy power, 33%, PV, 25%. By plan, 2025, and the renewable energy, 50% coming from the uh, renewable energy. And uh, for the first time in April this year, and it is higher than uh, 60 million megabytes uh, gigawatt hour and the half of them comes from the uh, PV and by 2050 and the German accounts for 50 percent from renewable energy by 2050 in France 100 percent renewable energy let's look at our neighbors that is uh, 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 Vietnam and uh, it is only uh, uh, um, uh, one of uh, 25th and uh, by uh, 2050 renewable energy 38 percent What does it mean that uh, the uh, 28, uh, 2008 uh, plan of China is very conservative because technology revolution is faster than our expectation? Therefore, when we are formulating the next step plan, we need to be more proactive and forward-looking. 
from 2008 to now in a span of 10 years because I'm from PV industry, we see radical changes in terms of technology. The battery efficiency increased from 13 to 15 percent to an uh, N-type battery. It is 24.58 um, uh, percent. And uh, in terms of components, power, uh, 200 watts, but now it is 400 watts above. And uh, Jinko, uh, double-sided, uh, 15 um, watts and 15 to 20 percent e efficiency. In total, the components give 500 watts. And in the past uh, years, this uh, cost goes down by 50 percent. 80 percent of the countries cut back the subsidies, and it is our competition me uh, mechanism in Abu Dhabi. And uh, 1.4 gigawatt power station investment, 2.4 billion dollars, which is the lowest in its tariff. And uh, now that in, uh, before you come here, you ask me this question. So, are you positive, you know, about this outlook? So, you know, you have given us so much data, and which expression, uh, which express kind of appeal. So, let's wait until later where we talk about specifics, and now we talk about some general pictures. Uh, Mr. Jai uh, has been nodding his head. And why you are nodding, you know, you could make some response to, you know, uh, whether, you know, this plan has been conservative and it's not aggressive enough. You know, whether we should do more to accelerate this transition. And last time, last year, you know, this report about uh, 50 cities uh, in China, how they are doing, moving towards this direction of low carbon. Could you make a response? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I worked in ADB for uh, 20 years and, again, and another 10 years in uh, African Development Bank. Uh, so in the energy investment, especially the electrification of the countryside, that has been my area of work in the past uh, three decades. So let me try to make a response. Uh, and before that, Let me uh, let me uh, give you a bad news. As uh, Atu just said, you know this uh, one point uh, five degree control is not feasible. And there's another bad news. By 2030, everybody has access to electricity. This goal is not going to be realized. You know this is a SDG of UN. So having said that, let me come to China, which is a uh, uh, highlight, you know, by 2015. You know, everybody in China has access to electricity. All the villages are connected uh, to uh, power. So by comparison, you know, China's experiences, China's uh, knowledge and experiences uh, can help other countries to improve situation in this regard and to help them realize this SDG goal of you know, enabling everybody having access to electricity by 2030. The uh, nationally speaking or globally speaking, this goal for renewable energy, whether it's conservative or aggressive, everybody has different opinions. Uh, 10 years ago, when I was working in ADB, Together with the management of ADB, where we were pushing a very aggressive plan within three years to realize the installation of 3G, 3 gigawatt for PV. At that time, you know, total capacity was less than 3G. And so, you know, this 3G objective was very aggressive. But what happened in 10 years' time? Last year, you know, in uh, instabil uh, insta installation, you know, 40 to 50 uh, gigawatt in China. So my point is that whatever uh, plan we put in place, you know, 
we believe in our endeavors, in believe in uh, a continued continuity of our policy, and I believe in the market force. Well, I'm sure you know we have we have to be positive and optimistic about future, based on my own experiences. So renewable energy is going to grow in a way that exceeds all our expectations. But uh, one essential uh, for us to achieve our objective, as I said, is to replicate our, you know, uh, China's practices, experiences, knowledge with other developing countries. Uh, it's not enough for China to, you know, to be good alone. China has to share with other countries. So continuity uh, is very important. You know, we're all concerned about this intermittent impact of wind power to the grid. And uh, I, uh, after 10 years, you know, it's feasible to address this concern uh, by means of technology. But unless we have a consistent policy, or if there's a fluctuation of the policy, then its impact uh, will be much huge, uh, tremendous, and huge than the technological impact on the renewable energy. So having a consistent policy is more important. Of course, uh, if we look back these 30 years that China has traveled, you know, uh, we have achieved what has been achieved you know, in the 30 years, uh, realized what has been achieved by uh, Western countries in 100 years. So all these twists and turns that we experienced and are going to be experienced by developing countries, you know, uh, really should be shared by China with, and ADB is in a position to facilitate such experience sharing. Again, with PV as an example. Uh, China is a, a major country of manufacturing sector. So we help developing countries with these PV projects. We heard kind of feedback from them. In the past, we focus on fossil fuel, and we have to do a lot of import. Now we have this renewable energy, energy transformation, uh, wind and PV equipment. If we still have to uh, import this equipment, then this uh, complete transformation is not, uh, then we're not achieving this complete transformation. So my point is that, you know, in different segments of the supply chain, you know, uh, to set up a manufacturing plant locally is very important, you know, to, uh, for this transformation. Uh, you know, and uh, I think you know uh, the state grid uh, has done a lot in this contribution, and they have shared with the Philippines, for instance. So they're exporting the experiences. That's something I would like to con congr congratulate, Mr. Shen. You could also share with us, you know. This China experiences uh, sharing with the rest of the world. I was reading an article recently about uh, leading uh, technology of China, this ex extra, uh, you know, uh, high pressure uh, China is already doing this. Uh, 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 11 uh, milling uh, voltage, but actually, you know, 5,000 for some countries is already uh, big enough. So it's difficult enough. So could you share with us what is the latest uh, movement and directions and what are the challenges in these areas? Uh, electricity, power, power sector is moving China, is developing very fast in China. State grid uh, has done a lot in terms of the technology development. Uh, 
we used to, you know, lagging behind, then uh, just as good, and try, now we, we're in a leading position. You know, this, especially this ultra uh, high voltage has been uh, giving this uh, uh, award, national award for science technology advancement in China. So it's fair to say the uh, advancement of the power sector uh, we have really made a lot of contributions uh, for the technology advancement in this sector. We have 24 you know, major uh, projects going on, this especially this ultra-high-voltage uh, project. It has improved the manage, uh, managerial uh, uh, level of the whole sector. Secondly, You know, there is a dislocation of the natural resource uh, distribution in China. So given that kind of national context, we, in order to uh, develop, we have to develop and tap the resource advantage in the West and turn it into uh, economic strength in eastern uh, coastal areas. And... Uh, this ultra high voltage technology has helped, you know, uh, develop this wind and uh, hydropower uh, resources into economic output and transmit it to the eastern part of China, and has uh, you know helped stimulate the economic growth of China as a whole. So this ultra high voltage technology. You know, has been applied in Brazil, you know, uh, in phase one, phase two project in Brazil. At the same time, uh, we have utilized and developed many hydropower in Brazil and has been highly accepted by the Brazilian government people. So this technology for the, you know, could make a difference uh, for the energy transformations, and uh, we are willing to share this technology with the rest of the world. At the same time, by innovative management, we would like to share with our managerial expertise, technology, uh, technologies with the rest of the world, and also state grid power it runs the most largest and most complex uh, grid in the world and also has the strongest uh, capacity to absorb renewable energy and uh, we has achieved a series of technological breakthroughs so far state uh, grid let me ask Uh, how um, how come that you 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 achieve these breakthroughs with this uh, you know uh, by building uh, your company into the grid that uh, has this largest capacity to absorb this renewable energy? First of all, it's a very robust uh, grid with technology, and also we put in place many uh, uh, hydro power stations, which acted as kind of reserve uh, power station. And also, we have done a lot of innovations for many th uh, thermal power stations, which are participating in balancing out the uh, power supply during the valley and peak times. So thank you very much for your introduction. Just look into the future where technology comes into play. Um, what are some of the bleeding edge technologies that you think are both technologically fe feasible and also potentially revolutionary in this sector? Yeah, I, um, I will talk about two or three of them briefly. Uh, since we've been talking so much about the electricity, maybe switch gears a bit to transportation. Uh, and actually one big area, uh, which is a big focus here in China, of course, is electric cars. And of course, a key component of that is, is the battery. So I think it's another good example where China could not only be a, a big consumer, 
of the technology of, electric, of uh, batteries domestically, but also a leader globally in building the, the infrastructure and building uh, the capacity to, to manufacture uh, batteries and storage more broadly, which will be needed uh, if you want to electrify transportation, particularly the light duty transportation, which electricity will be a good way to decarbonize. So I think that's one technology I will, I will put out. Uh, the second one, you know, we haven't, although there has been huge progress in China uh, on renewables, we heard about that, uh, there is also, we have to acknowledge that China has also built a lot of coal uh, generation. If you're looking at our own data in IHS market over the last kind of 15 years, China has built about 800 gigawatts of new coal. Now, the challenge with the new coal, which is needed, so nothing wrong with that, but the challenge is that these coal plants are going to be here for decades to come, and if you want to decarbonize this coal uh, generation, uh, instead of shutting it down, one other technology is carbon capture. Uh, I think China has a big opportunity to be a leader in not only demonstrating that CCS works, but actually scaling it. I think the whole world is going to depend upon uh, carbon capture. I cannot see we, as a world, shutting down coal-fired generation in places not only like China and India, the United States, where you know, we have still a lot of coal. Coal is still 25, no, 40%, I'm sorry, of global power generation, so we need to think about. So that's the second technology I would highlight. And the third one I would highlight is hydrogen. So, uh, you know, those of us who have been in the industry for a long time may remember that hydrogen was the big focus about 20 years back. The reason I think hydrogen is important is to what I said earlier. If you look at hard to decarbonize industrial manufacturing, electricity is not the best way to decarbonize. Electricity is very expensive to, you know, use for, say, steel or cement. Gas is much cheaper, about one-third the cost of electricity in most places. But if we can make clean hydrogen, whether it is coming from curtailed the renewables or it is coming from uh, coal with sequestration yes. would be a, a great way to decarbonize that sector. And I think, again, China has an opportunity. We in IHS market are doing quite a lot of work around hydrogen, both in terms of where you generate it from and how do you use it. There are clearly technical issues, but I'll just highlight those three as really scalable technologies. I mean, that's a lot of other things, but those three, and it will be interesting to hear from other panelists as to what do they think about those. So you talk about these different technologies that could be applied in different stages, you know, CCS or CCUS. So, you know, without changing the present uh, uh, energy mix, uh, you know, we could uh, uh, make this energy more uh, clean. So we still have about 20 uh, minutes so in order to ensure uh, the audience could ask uh, some questions, let me ask uh, Professor Xun a question. Uh, I'm sure you are well informed of this uh, global energy transforma transformation. Uh, the new players coming into play, you know, this uh, landscape would uh, have uh, produced a global impact, you know, with these new partnerships and alliances they are going to create in this new energy china is the biggest uh, producer or uh, has the large capacity so in your opinion you know what kind of uh, impact china is going to have uh, going forward every uh, february uh, we uh, together with opec and international uh, energy uh, agency and gicf to organize a meeting in Riyadh to discuss some energy-related issues. Let me cut the long story short. Based on their forecast, our international energy forum invite uh, you know, Boston Consulting Group Energy uh, Center to make some comparisons and to produce another uh, uh, report. Based on this forecast, by 2040, the total energy mix is kind of, you know, for coal, oil, natural gas, and new energy will make up four, one-fourth of each. So for China, as Mr. Chen said, you know, our goal has been a bit uh, conservative. By 2040 or 2050, the coal is going to make up 33 percent. Renewable, 
five percent approximately, so one third for each of them. I've just joined G20 minister meeting. And there was this story, because at the end of the day of the G20 meeting, uh, there is a brief. There was a briefing, sometimes all the way until two or three o'clock in the morning, and they were discussing the traditional energy and the renewable energies, and they couldn't reach consensus. Even it was two or three o'clock in the morning, and. They couldn't reach consensus on a wording, past tense or current tense of the wording. So, and, and they have different opinions against the Paris Accord. So in a transformation of the energy mix, in energy mix, the two sides are not reaching consensus. In China, the coal take 59%, India 62%. Japan, nearly 30 percent. Same story for South Korea. And African countries and Eastern Southern Asian countries, they couldn't get rid of the uh, large percentage of coal fire. So that is the global landscape. As discussed by Mr. Jai, I believe during the energy transformation, there are several key technologies. To put the stories short, the first technology is um, storage, energy or power storage, be it wind power or solar power is not continuous. So we shouldn't rely on the uh, generation without storage. During the rainy season, without storage could be a huge issue. Wind power as well, so uh, power storage technology for the future is essential, uh, including oil and gas. The second technology is hydrogen. In the G20 minister, uh, energy minister meeting, we were organized to visit the hydrogen. It's from uh, water, and it has zero carbon dioxide emission. The problem now is in the cost. If we use, so they compare uh, gas, natural gas, and the uh, hydrogen is huge. And then CCUS is the third technology. It's essential for carbon capture and storage. ODCF is organizing the uh, efforts globally. China has put great efforts into it. In our oil fields, uh, we're actually using CCUS. The last. technology. As you note, carbon dioxide stays in the air for a short period of time. And in the oil and gas production, how to control the emission to the air? And if it's a pl uh, the uh, production is marine-based, if ignition happens, then exp uh, exploitation, uh, the, uh, there could be huge damage. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. I've made commitments to you that questions and answers uh, would be given during the session. So if you have any questions, and if you're from the industry, please raise your hands. Somebody will give you a microphone and then speak. Thank you. Please give this microphone to the lady. Thanks. Thank you. Very interesting panel. Christina Lampi, on uh, Kidenza Innovation, a tech pioneer with World Economic Forum. Um, China's role in the future of the energy is very, very important. So my question to this panel is, how can you help establish sense of urgency and lead with success stories of basically decarbonization? How can China provide a glowing example for others to follow? Uh, Maybe I will answer, try to answer this question, also take this chance to have a second round of talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
In fact, that uh, uh, it's been a question I've been reflecting, and so also part of our job, ADB's job in Asia, but uh, globally, uh, the uh, international organizations having, you know, uh, same kind of uh, trend in thinking how China's experience can be shared with other countries. Uh, before I specifically spell out what can be done, I, I think there is uh, another bad news here, even in China, within China, that uh, uh, we say that China has achieved 100% of electrification by 2015. But if you look at the ratio of uh, Chinese household in rural areas, uh, and also nationwide, that more than 40%, we are still using uh, uh, fuels that are not so clean, and source of pollution, indoor, but also outdoor pollution. And, and that has not been resolved. I, we're talking about technologies just now. None of these technologies will help the rural household to have the clean cooking yeah. and clean heating. I think that technology has to be invented. Uh, and part of my job uh, now, each time I come back to China, I'm looking for uh, solutions and proposals from industry and from researchers that how do we provide clean energy for cooking and heating in China and similar contexts. And that's, that's a big question. I think if China can help in, uh, in uh, leading in such areas that's been overlooked by, by <laughs> many advanced high-level technologies, and that's a great help for other countries because the clean cooking and clean uh, heating has been a, even a bigger problem in Africa and the rest of Asia. So that area, I think China can lead also finding a solution. Once China is in, with Chinese uh, uh, scale of market, with the level of finance cap capability and supply chain, and China will be able to make things cheaper. Uh, my friend Dr. Sun has mentioned that hydrogen is so expensive, but I, I'm also very confident that when China becomes interested yes. with the scale yes. of the market, with the supply chain we have, you will see very soon that uh, the cost of hydrogen will, will come down. So um, I'm quite uh, uh, confident that uh, uh, there is a great scope for China and the rest of the world to cooperate together. Yeah, thank you. Scalability and top-down. Scalability and the top-down approaches are the two strengths China has. When you are uh, thinking what questions to ask, let me ask a question towards Madam Qian. Would you please briefly answer my following question? Mr. Jai mentioned the political influences in the year 2020. The energy industry would have many changes in the carbon trade, et cetera, et cetera. Would you please uh, have your weight in this issue? See, I think the, the Chinese, what um, other countries can learn from Chinese China that is when is uh, like in 2008 that China for the first time to include the uh, renewable energy target into its uh, 50 years plan the, the the country's most important uh, strategy and uh, development blueprints so this is one thing the second is in uh, in 2009 that China launched its first FIT for for renewable energies to accelerate the, uh, the development of uh, uh, solar and wind. So, and uh, uh, last years we canceled we canceled the uh, the FIT because uh, nowadays that the the solar has become the, one of the cheapest energy source. So, almost every country can implement solar power without need of fiscal support. So this is the, the in in, uh, in the uh, aspect of the uh, of the policy side. So and uh, also that in 2015 or 15 yes, China launched the top runner program, setting laws for minimum efficiency level and the industry standard for solar energy. Uh, that's that's to promote the most advanced uh, technology and uh, so. In this um, aspect that um, some other countries, especially the developing countries, can learn from China. Thank you. Uh, just a quick uh, comment on the question. Uh, what is interesting to me is that if you look back, I mean, let's be honest, China has been instrumental in getting solar and wind on the global stage. You know, without China, 
they would be nowhere, you know, in terms of the cost decline. I think what will be interesting to see is what happens to the batteries for light duty vehicles, because just China has just uh, eliminated or cut the subsidy significantly, you know, at the end of June. So if the, both the state level and also at the federal level, if the electric car industry continues to grow in China, in spite of the reduction in subsidy, that would be a very big signal to the rest of the world that this industry can survive on scale. And I, I read after getting here that now the government is looking at hydrogen. So I think this could be a conveyor belt of new technologies which get subsidy for a time being while they scale and then the subsidies go away. And that would be a great model for the rest of the world to pick up and use. Why only in China? Cultivate the new energy and then they will find their business model. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Isabella Hilton. I, I run China Dialogue, which looks at climate change and environmental issues. Um, we've been hearing about China's leadership role in renewable technologies, the importance of bringing the cost down. Um, we've been hearing that, that solar can now do without a, a support for a feed-in tariff. Uh, in, most, in many geographies, and yet if you look at the energy projects on the Belt and Road, there seems to be a kind of policy lag and a time lag, because, because overwhelmingly these are fossil fuel, many of them are high emitting, and a very large number of them are coal-fired power stations. So China committed to reducing coal at home, but is still building new coal uh, outside China, which of course makes it very difficult for host countries to... Uh, to commit fully to climate uh, control. So I, I just wonder what are the factors that seem to be inhibiting China's deployment of its, its advantages in renewable technologies in helping other countries take that path rather than the high emitting path and how can these be overcome? Who's willing to weigh in this issue? And uh, for this one, I feel that the uh, China is a uh, big country for the uh, coal, uh, the uh, production and consumption. And by this part, uh, uh, also uh, India, a uh, similar situation. So I feel uh, maybe I, I'm not from coal industry, but I feel that also uh, I am working for international organization. And probably I'm not right person to comment about China, the policy, but I personally, uh, if any media here like to probably prisoner, I feel several reasons. The one, the first reason is because China is a big coal reserve and the production country. So, so far, uh, although China joined the Paris Agreement and committed to highly close the, the many of the, uh, the mills and the plants and the uh, factories uh, 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 fueled by the coal, and also and make efforts for the coal uh, power plant to uh, be more clean. Uh, and the control is the emission uh, of this uh, dust and the, uh, 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 the uh, sulfur and others. Of course, uh, these are the, uh, the efforts, but that's true. Yeah, the coal is still there. And now the uh, total consumption of coal reduced each year about 1 to 1.5 percent. Now that's from the original 68 percent. Now come to about 59 percent is the uh, efforts. And the second one, I personally feel that probably is the employment. Yeah, because the coal industry in the history is more than three million staff workers. Yeah. Now they close this already each year. I don't know exactly, but a lot of the miners, they are loosed up because close the, the, the mines. And then this is a big pressure. And for the urbanization, China each year, and they have about 10 million people come to the city. So this is the employment issue also. And also each year, about seven to eight million of these new students who are graduated from university needs a job also. Uh, so, and also the, uh, the others of this, the uh, energy transition others. So probably this is another reason uh, for this, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the reason. Uh, and of course, uh, for the China's uh, the coal industry itself, I personally believe that they make a good effort. Uh, and also, some of the, in the developing countries uh, in uh, Asia or in Africa, they still need some of these, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coals because the, uh, the, uh, so far for energy poverty and energy access is an issue. And uh, so far, still have one billion people no access for the electricity. 
And in the future, another two more billion people will come to this world by 2050. So this is also an issue. By this time, G20 meeting also have a lot of discussion about this issue. I, I feel that this is in general uh, some of the, uh, the factors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who want to add? I would like to add. For this question, the hosting country should have a um, energy plan, and this plan dictates the following actions. And the coal fire plants built by uh, China has the best technologies in both the production and also the emission. We help them to build not only coal fire stations, but also um, hydro, hydro plants, power plants. Uh, so I believe the key issue is the host country's energy policy. If this policy can encourage renewable energy, uh, then the Chinese companies will definitely provide facilitation of renewable energy development in those countries. So we should address issues of different phases with a development vision. In terms of development vision, let me respond briefly. We believe uh, the coal issue could be interpreted from the political prospect, but also there's uh, the two perspective of market and economy value. If coal loses its market value, then this issue will go away. Since now we have forecasted that the coal fire plants will lose its value in the future, and we are following the trend of the market. We should have our trust in the market. We should believe in the competitiveness of the renewable energies. ADB has a statement to eliminate all dirty, so-called dirty energies. We're rationalizing our energy policy. In our current energy policy, coal fire and natural gas have their places. How to integrate a future development lies in our uh, interpretation of the new policies. Policy is one thing. But we should uh, believe that uh, market has bigger power to play. Still have some time for the last question. Uh, there's this gentleman holding a microphone. Maybe two of you can ask your questions, and then uh, the, the panelists can choose which question to uh, answer. I'm from Dali. I'm a journalist. I'm from Dali Media Group. I have a question for uh, the state grade company's representative. And the state grade mentioned the contents of uh, the connecting of things. So would you please elaborate measures? to implement for the connection of things. I'm from manufacturing industry. Our company in last week announced our carbon uh, emission reduction by 50%. So my question is, uh, goes to Mr. Sun An Chai. If we're uh, making efforts to reduce the emissions, uh, what kind of um, Opinions could you or uh, uh, consultant uh, consultant opinions to, you can provide to us in state grid this year uh, we uh, mentioned our strategic targets to implement President Xi Jinping's thoughts of energy industry state grid should be a hub, a platform, a sharing points for everyone, a powerful a grade and a grade that connect things. We will put information technology into the traditional power industry, including the uh, internet 
technology. So there will be high-level integration of different technologies. We've already drafted the plan for the connection, connection of things to be integrated into our power grid. And in our demonstration areas, uh, we've got uh, good feedbacks from the users. The public is focusing on this effort, and so we are trying our best to guide the traditional uh, great companies for its transformation. A brief reply. In my speech during the G20 meeting, the first energy is the uh, efficiency. If you want to reduce emission by 50%, you should improve your efficiency and use uh, the uh, state-of-the-art technologies and to rationalize your energy mix. So combine uh, economic value and technologies. Thank you. One phrase only for the entire upper stream and lower stream a must-have cost and profit balance to achieve this entire uh, balance, as we say. Uh, we're discussing with the government how to match uh, cost and profit balance. Uh, are there any uh, detailed policies uh, undergoing and uh, still going on? Offline, uh, maybe you could discuss more. Uh, we have such a broad topic today involving uh, the industry, the policies from the government. Uh, now I would like each of you to give us a statement. Energy concerns the environment. And the environment uh, has huge impact uh, on all of us. So when we're educating our future generations, how uh, for them to have responsible energy consumption, what would you say? Only one statement. Thank you, each of you. Let me start. In the Chinese website, website, uh, it said 1.4 billion population uh, is covered by electricity. So how did China achieve that? So my question is, if in the future years, 1.4 billion Chinese population and are using clean energy to cook, to heat, and how did China achieve that? And that's a huge contribution from China to the world. That's the next challenge. Children, in terms of energy consumers. Th three words, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> we use the four words, clean, green, high efficiency, affordable, which means a good economy. Thank you very much. Next and next and next, the generation to have the same or even better, at least not worse environment and climate as we have now. Clean energy is developing. China is taking actions. State grid is taking actions. New energy is developing, I believe that we can enjoy a very promising future. OK, I believe this is the best conclusion to this session. I want to thank all the participants, all the guests, experts. Thank you for such a good and wonderful questions. More questions, if you have any. I believe there are more discussions involved. Maybe next year, when we meet up in Davos, we can see the solutions to the problems we raised. We take actions. We need to take faster actions. Thank you very much.